Hello everyone. Um, welcome to this, our second session. Um, if you're in the previous session, you might know that I had some tech issues, so I'm sorry that we're just taking a few minutes to get started with this session. Um, Nahida and Uma, hello. <laughs> Hello. Hope will be joining us shortly. She's just taking a moment to recover from the opening session for those of you that joined us for that. Um, and this session, we're going to be diving more deeply into the work that we facilitated together. So Hope and I, who you may have met in the opening session, if you joined us for that, and Uma and Nahida, um, facilitated a series of what we called contextualized conversations in different regions, looking at the topic of cultivating caring and compassionate aid organizations. And those were held um, last year, actually during COVID. So we'd originally imagined we were gonna have those in spaces and meet with people, but eventually they, like everything else in the past, um, year or year and a half nearly now went online. So we're going to share about our learning from those conversations in this session um, and hope will, as I said, join us shortly. So just to give us a moment to arrive in this session and to get started, I'm just going to invite you just to take a moment and I want to take one myself just to again breathe and arrive in this different space it looks a little bit different from the opening session here um, some of you will be able to potentially come on camera and chat with us if you'd like to some of your screens are showing um, you can also just watch so i can see that there are a lot of people who are just watching the session but this is more of an interactive session than the previous session on the stage was and so there will be possibility for people to come on and ask us things if you'd like to and for now you might just be seeing the three of us and as i said um, you'll see hope shortly too but um these conversations really came out of the realization that we've spoken to already that well-being is contextual and means different things to different people and we really wanted to as i said in the opening session tend to the process that we were in around what does it mean to cultivate caring and compassionate aid organizations by asking more people and engaging more people in what did well-being mean for them and how were they interested in participating in this conversation but and also in working for change in their organizations in the way that they did their work and so in order to do that we chose to facilitate conversations in different regions of the world and in a moment i'm going to come to uma and i think maybe uma, you could just introduce yourself and what we're each going to do is we're each going to share so um we're going to hear from uma first but we'll come to each of us so i hope and i were also facilitated these conversations and the hide who you also see there was too and we're each going to share just briefly with you some of what we learned from the conversations that we facilitated and the themes that really stood out for us from them and also some of the barriers challenges and questions that came out of them as well so uma welcome can you hear me, uh, Marianne? We are hearing you loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the. Uh, thanks for allowing me to arrive. You sounded like my yoga instructor. Um, <laughs> today, um, I'm going to share some of the uh, lessons, or rather, some of the highlights from the conversations that we had in Asia. And this was hosted by Community World Service uh, Asia, based out of uh, Pakistan, and about nine organisations participated. So my name is Uma, and I'm based in Malaysia. I'm an HROD consultant. Pleasure to share the flat platform with you today. So. So these uh, conversations uh, were participated by INGO, NGO, faith-based organizations. And just to set the context a little bit, uh, some of these organizations, they are purely based uh, at country level. Uh, and some of them, they have head office in Europe and one in the US. Uh, so there's this diverse uh, view, not only looking at a perspective of the countries based in Asia with Asian nationals per se, but also the link with some of the uh, head office uh, as such. And uh, here are some of the highlights. 
Uh, the topic itself, caring uh, organization or rather staff well-being is not new. Uh, staff care well-being is something that is practiced uh, according to these uh, representatives from the organization. Uh, all the organizations is doing it, is thinking about it, and maybe the way they are doing it is different, but they are definitely doing it. So these conversations have actually helped the organization to pay more attention to it, to be more structured, and in fact, to make it a higher priority uh, within the organization. So for us, and I say us because I was also part of that conversation and not like outside uh, the circle as such, for us, it was fascinating to discuss the understanding of well-being, what does it mean? And uh, what we discovered is the meaning of well-being is similar. All, all, all of them uh, in the conversation said that this is how we understood well-being, it's feeling good, we are able to perform, we are, uh, uh, our stress is managed. So in terms of understanding of the meaning is not different. However, what we found is that, uh, what we discovered is that the application and emphasis of what would work to improve well-being is very different. So the factors that contribute uh, to well-being is what we felt is different. So for example, uh, for the organizations in Asia, they strongly attribute management practices and terms and conditions as a significant factor that affects well-being of staff. So, for example, where organizations are uh, struggling with uh, basic uh, salary, uh, even to get the payment of salary in time or to make sure that the staff are retained uh, within the organization, and also in some of the countries where labor law is not very strong, and so legally you do not have the staff protection, so this is felt as a major stress um, factor, both for individual staff as well as for the leadership. So for the leadership, how are they going to maintain this? And this is a huge stress factor. And this, uh, for example, this view uh, is, may, may not be the same for organizations that are far more uh, well-resourced. So for some of the organizations uh, where they have uh, the head office in Europe, for example, the emphasis is on mental health. Mental health is not necessarily uh, well-received uh, or uh, is not seen as a major a priority by the organizations uh, in, in Asia, and we are talking about nine organizations or so. And um, perhaps because this is not well understood, perhaps they, the staff don't understand the need, but then the, what, what we understood is in some cases, the partner organizations from Europe keep pushing uh, for the uh, organizations in Asia to take on this mental health professional support. And when this is offered to the staff, the staff are not uh, really buying in or wanting to take this particular mental health support. And maybe also because the staff, they have their own way of coping. Maybe they have their own family or any uh, extended structure that could support this particular uh, aspect uh, of, their, of their life. What we also uh, discovered is that patriarchal leadership, which stifles a female staff to speak up, or leading female staff to being more assertive than usual just to get points across adds to the stress and particularly to the uh, female staff. On that note, uh, we agreed that well-being should not be genderized and not seen as a female role uh, to be the carer or to be the well-being provider. And this is something uh, all of them felt that they should uh, change uh, strongly in the organization. Now, reflecting the practices in their own organization, some of them or all of them felt that there is a disconnect between the policy and practice. Maybe the HR related policies, including well being aspects, are there in paper, but these are not fully implemented. Therefore, this also links to the organization culture that sometimes does not adequately promote uh, well being. Now, the other points uh, that stood out uh, in this conversation was. Uh, having a common understanding of well-being is important and also what staff can expect from the organization is also important. Uh, what was highlighted is uh, the need, uh, the wellness need is very diverse and there's this bandwidth issues to support all the requirements. So different staff needs need to be fulfilled when it comes to the wellness. So uh, in fact, each one person who participated in the conversation had their own stress factors that affected their well-being. So to what extent uh, does the organization uh, fulfill the needs, uh, the wellness needs of staff? And also uh, the question is, 
how does a compassionate and a caring organization look like? Uh, am I uh, an organization that is more caring than your organization? What do I do to show that I'm more caring than the other? So how does it look like? And what was also, we felt uh, not very clear and, and through this conversation, which was highlighted is that what are the indicators for organization to be caring and compassionate. Most of the organizations, they said, we are doing our part. Yes, we are doing, we are providing a lot of support. We care about our staff, but would you agree? Would the other organization agree? So what is the benchmark like? So this was also something that was um, highlighted. And um, I think there was also the question about the balance between the organizational responsibility versus self-responsibility. Evidently, most or all of them agree that the organization has a duty of care. But what about self-responsibility? What about self-care? So sometimes I think this is uh, not necessarily uh, paid attention to. There's a lot of expectation that organizations should be doing something, but to what extent is the staff taking, uh, or as individuals, uh, staff are taking the initiative to pay attention uh, to their well-being. So this was also uh, something uh, that was highlighted. And I think from the Asian context, again, this is not to um, generalize as such. This is just some of the things that emerged from the conversation. Uh, some of the staff, they are not necessarily uh, independent or mature. So sometimes um, if you look at the job description, there's this uh, clause which says uh, able to work independently with minimal supervision. Now, this is not always the case. So often this is also uh, is affecting the, um, the well-being and performance because there's a lot of need to keep monitoring, keep supervising uh, some of the staff. And sometimes there's lack of maturity to take care of uh, both performance as well as well-being. And this is also linked to uh, personal accountability. And I think um, some of the other points, uh, maybe my other colleagues will speak. For us, we thought these were the uh, key uh, areas uh, that we felt was uh, quite uh, interesting and a bit different. So uh, all in all, uh, in uh, each of the person uh, attending this uh, conversation, who attended the conversation, they were undergoing different level of stress. So we felt that the conversation was helpful to share experience and also in a way measure uh, the different uh, uh, well-being activities or well-being initiatives that organizations uh, have undertaken. All in all, there were about nine of us, all female. In the beginning, uh, most of us were a bit concerned why the men did not join, but in the end, everybody said it's good that the men did not join because we enjoyed really this uh, space only for the female to join and uh, talk about this important issue. Back to you, Marianne. Thank you so much, Uma, for sharing your love. I'm going to come straight to know Haida now. Feel free to tell us who you are as well. Uma, I don't know if we heard who you are. Did you want to add anything about who you are? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> if, <laughs> go ahead, no, Haida. Welcome. Thank you, Marianne, and thanks, Uma. Um, so my name is Nahida or Haida, and I am actually just a neighbor of Uma because I come from Singapore, but I'm currently based in Turkey for the last many years. Um, I just keep you know, sticking around, even though I keep saying I want things to go. Um, I'm, I am a long term and have always been an aid worker. So I currently work for the UN doing humanitarian assistance. Uh, on the side, I do projects, you know, with these beautiful ladies over here uh, on caring and compassionate organizations, but also are very interested in wellness and mental well being and so on and so forth. Um, so my uh, conversations happen in the Middle East and North Africa. And it was very interesting because um, I was an outsider facilitating a conversation of which I felt some similarities, but also a lot of differences from where I come from and my perceptions and so on. Uh, and the conversations that happened with uh, colleagues, basically, that are, uh, we had colleagues joining from Turkey, um, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and uh, some I think there were two joining in uh, all the way from Afghanistan. And it was very interesting because it was a mix of both, um, you know, uh, 
uh, national staff, local staff, but at the same time, international colleagues as well. So it was very interesting to hear perspective of both, you know, local and national um, aid workers versus uh, international staff when it comes to well-being and, um, you know, create uh, sort of mental health and things like that. Um, there are some similarities uh, that, you, you know, uh, to what Uma is saying earlier. Um, we talk a lot, quite a bit about duty of care and how a lot of the perception of that happens to link immediately to, oh, that's just report responsibility of HR. Uh, a lot of when we talk about wellness and well-being, it's like, oh, that's just an HR's job. You know, as as and, and in turn, the, the it was very interesting because the people that were HR personnel in the conversation was like, but we have so much to do that just adds more stress that I have to now look after you as well. And and, and so it was a very interesting conversation about how people perceive wellness as sometimes somebody has to do it for them. Uh, and this brings about that, you know, uh, the topic of, you know, to what, it, where is the extent of our sort of personal responsibility, organization responsibility, and how do you balance that? Uh, we didn't have any very specific answers, but I think it helped that people start to see that HR's role was not just that, that you also have to come a little bit forward and work with them on uh, well-being. Within the sort of Middle East and North African context, um, it was very interesting because uh, we had a quite a sizable, a fair amount of men and women in the conversation. And the interesting part was that in one conversation, for example, uh, we decided to focus it within the context of COVID-19. And a number of, uh, of the participants were parents. And to a large extent, they were very, um, you know, one interesting comment and I quote here, I remember somebody saying that, you know, it didn't occur to them that wellness was that important and taking care of themselves was that necessary until they are stuck in the house, uh, having to work, look after their children and having to make sure that they themselves don't burn out. Uh, and, and suddenly it hit them like, oh no, I, I, you know, I, should, I need to go exercise. I need to, you know, do a little bit of stretching. I need to make sure I eat. I need to look after my children. Suddenly it hit them. So in a lot of set, in a lot of ways, the feedback we get was for a lot of um, participants coming from the Middle East and a number of them were Syrians. They noted that because for them, um, it did not register as immediate priority. Uh, and a lot of them were Syrian, um, you know, refugees or have, you know, come with, as they say, you know, with, with, with a different set of trauma and a background where currently their priorities are extremely different. So, and, and it was interesting because I've never really quite thought about it that way. And I come with certain stereotypes thinking like, you know, yes, you know, it's important, but, to, you know, to a lot of my Syrian colleagues, it's not an immediate you know, uh, priority. It, 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 it comes as an afterthought as after somebody else has been taken care of, then they look after themselves. So it was very interesting how well-being for them was couched in a very communal terms. Uh, if their moms are okay, if their families, if their extended family are taken care of, their children are looked after, if, you know, their colleagues in the field in Syria are looked after, then they're like, okay, then I, I, you know, I, 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 I can come to myself. So it, it should, and the, and the, the feedback we get was that it showed a lot in the work they do. And a number of the participants also work for local and Syrian NGOs. So the resources that are available to them uh, when it comes to duty of care or well-being was extremely sort of limited and for many actually non-existent. Uh, as opposed to, you know, the UN and INGOs having a bit more resources and understanding and support from like the HQ and so on. Uh, so that's really quite a perspective that is by, uh, you know, sort of espoused by a number of our Syrian, uh, you know, and local um, national staff that were participating in the conversations. Um, and, and, and to a large extent, there was also this uh, participants felt that because wellness is not, uh, how do I put it, not led by example. And this is something I feel sometimes I personally am guilty of because I work, when I work a lot and, my, and, I, I, and I insist my team do more, they kind of take in on more. So I felt personally like, oh, you know, that was me. And, um, and they, they pointed out, well, if my boss is in the office until eight, then I still have to work until eight. 
or if my boss is still online and you know responding to messages after a certain hour or on the weekends i feel obliged there's that sense of obligation to you know constantly be, be working thus your well-being kind of you know setting boundaries about your well-being becomes a little bit harder when your organization are not quite leading it by example and the INGO perspective was also well a lot of our well-being and wellness efforts tend to be top bottom meaning that HQ decides like okay we need to include this on that make sure people are doing self-care measures make sure people are you know there's we have you know access for you on headspace and make sure you go and meditate there's a bit more it becomes instructive as opposed to empowering people to take it on to themselves to take care of their own well-being because it matters not because it is another checklist uh so people felt stressed that like okay my organization has all this list of well-being resources i need to go look at them i need to go sign up for headspace i need to meditate it becomes a need as opposed to being empowered so that was a big conversation topic we had because people feel stressed that they now have to take care of their stress so it just becomes a continuous cycle which i definitely feel like yeah that that was that was me in motion just you know, stressing out because i wasn't taking care of myself and then i stress out other people and you know and so on and so forth um the last point that i uh, i just want to share with uh, with what happened in our conversations is to a large extent people feel culturally it is not um it, how do I put it? It is not necessarily uh, they feel selfish if they were to put their well-being front and center and be and ask for it. They feel like, well, if other if other people are you know sort of like working hard or you know doing their best, I want to do that as well. I don't want to be seen as you know uh, being selfish because there's a bit of a communal mentality where we don't want to look like the selfish one and people might talk about it and like, well, you know, she just took, took the half the day off and decided not to, you know, respond to messages or things like that, or, you know, people taking leave, you know, a lot of uh, people here, we talk a lot about like how bad and guilty we feel for taking leave and vacation because there's so much to do. And if people inside Syria, for example, are suffering, how can we, be too overly concerned with our well-being when we are safe and healthy and doing okay so i think we didn't have a lot of like uh it was a very very interesting conversations that happened over uh, a period of three months and i must say that it puts a lot of perspective for me and my colleagues who you know were participating in terms of how you know we didn't have any great solutions but at the end of the day it it felt it felt liberating to be sharing those concerns. And I think at the end of it, we did say like, maybe this is the start of how we take care of ourselves, you know? Maybe the start of having these conversations is how we start becoming a little bit more aware, empowered to like, okay, you know what? I don't have to do big, grandiose, you know, gestures, but I can start small by talking about it with people, you know? Um, and, and we still actually now keep in touch. So that's actually quite nice because we're just checking in with each other. How's it going? Have you taken your vacation and things like that? So maybe it's a bit more of a long movement as opposed to a big haul in the change of policy. But uh, yeah, I, I, I must say that, you know, I, I felt positive walking out of that conversations. And I think, well, I hope my other colleagues also felt the same way, but yeah. Uh, over to you, Marianne. That's from my side. Thanks, Haida, for sharing your experience. I want to say a few things about the conversations that I facilitated that were with people based in Europe. Um, who were mostly people working in uh, international NGOs, um, but of different sizes and types with different perspectives. And many of the people that joined my conversations were people who had a specific responsibility to well-being, for well-being, or for HR and staff care related matters in their organisations. Um, so, um, Sophia's really also I just want to draw what attention to something before I say a bit more about that Sophia asked in the chat and I just want to say that these what we're reflecting on are spaces that we facilitated which were kind of confidential um, practice spaces they weren't a research as such they were more of a conversation and uh, an, an exploration and so we're not publishing like a in-depth report on all the things that were said in those spaces but there will be a facilitation guide that's 
based on the draft guide that we use for these conversations that will be shared um, by CHS. Um, it's not available yet, but it will be available very soon. So I just wanted to say that and then I'll come back to what I observed and learned a bit from the conversations that we held um, in Europe. And the thing that I really want to draw attention to, and I probably mentioned it a bit in the opening session as well, but is that um, there are um, the, the conversations that were held in the space that I facilitated, a lot of them looked at like how do we as people with a responsibility for well-being, staff care, those kinds of areas in an organization, how do we get the attention of senior leaders? How do we get the attention of people with more positional power in our organization to really take seriously the importance of resourcing um, and give and resourcing? I don't just mean money. Like sometimes the finances aren't the biggest deal, but the time, the time for people to pay attention to the culture within the organization and the time for people to pay attention to their well-being not just as individuals but collectively so the well-being of their team the well-being of the people around them and and um there's this tension and we talked about it in the opening session if we um have organizations that are very structured particularly particularly perhaps larger organizations where people have responsibility for specific remits of work that we don't always feel the possibility to be able to weave together these conversations that are so interconnected so the person who's responsible for well-being may not be able to really impact culture and the person who's responsible maybe for the diversity work or the anti-racism work may not be that connected with the person whose responsibility is around staff care and well-being and yet we know that these issues are connected and so what i heard a lot in the conversations i hosted was uh, were questions challenges and learning around how to really engage um across organizations and then also cross sector to bring attention to issues around well-being and to link them up with issues around culture with issues around power as we had talked about it earlier and so I think that that you know in in some ways what I heard in my conversations is part of what's fed into the structure of this gathering so that you know that just to really clearly name that um but also I think that that's something that that has that that come came out clearly from um all the conversations in different ways that if we when we isolate well-being as kind of just a sort of um issue that we can attend to on its own it's sort of or an extra as, as Heide said like an extra to do <laughs> then it doesn't become integrated in the culture of who we are and 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 the problem which we maybe haven't spoken so much about but the problem is that people who aren't able in their work to pay attention to their well-being or in who are in organizations where there isn't sufficient care provided in the culture for staff and that doesn't always mean huge investment in specific programs but more um, you know, some investment of time and resource in making sure your people are well enough to do their work. And the problem is that when that doesn't happen, you get huge problems. And some of those problems we talked about already a bit in this um, this gathering, you know, uh, challenges around um, harm that may happen within or around our organisations. But you also get a lot of people who are really exhausted, <laughs> who are really, you know, and who may not, not be, um, functioning or are likely not functioning in the best way that they can to create the change in the world that or our organizations are are seeking to create because they're just there's too much and they're not able to take sufficient time to care for themselves so i think it for me what really comes out of all the work we've done so far in the initiative is this importance of bringing a conversation about well what does all of that mean to the kind of the heart of how we organize and run our organizations so it's not a, it's not like a tick box policy thing it isn't necessarily even like a mental health program or a staff support program and all of those things might be valuable parts of it but it's like what is a culture that really supports us to thrive in order to be able to do the work we're here to do and um and so that's those are the, the the reflections that keep coming to me in this work and came to me from the conversations we had in this part of the world. Hope. Thanks very much, Mary. I'm sorry I had a bit of problem at the beginning with my uh, internet. 
Okay, thanks very much. Uh, hi, Dante Mary, and, and I'm going to build on what you have said. I speak from sub-Saharan continent, and I, as an African woman, living on the continent and working on the continent. So the people I interacted I with, or organizations I engaged with, are on the African continent, and they range from West Africa to South Africa. I'll talk about some of the causes of wellness as they explain, as they explain them to me, some of the strategies that have been used, and the efforts that to so most of the people I talked to were women working in women's organizations, but talked a few men, you know, uh, as well. The key question is, when I go to work, how do I take who I How do I take my hat and not feel it at the gate, throbbing, and pick it on my way back? And if I take my hat to work, am I going to be seen as a professional person? Some of the the the, the, the so ungroundedness, as we kept referring to unwellness, being ungrounded, being, you know, uh, <clears throat> so much so that even in the morning you can't find your keys while you are holding them in your hands. That kind of unwell being that makes one forget even how they if they go, but they don't know how they got there. They are to work mistakes because they are unwell. The reasons have to do with the kind of work from the feminist perspective that the, the, the kind of work working on context issues of abortion, contested issues of sexual orientation, fighting for uh, resources, you know, resources in communities, natural resources, land, water, and other things. Uh, supporting women um, who have been violated and sometimes even putting them in safe spaces. Uh, entrenched family issues, you are, you are working, but at the same time, people may be even your spouse who is HIV positive. You, you know, how do you take that work? How do of the organization, how do you tell your boss that actually you, you came late because as far as I tell hospital, you know, will they understand that? And that's what I mean by taking your, yourself, your heart, your emotions, whatever you want to work, um, trying to trying to be professional, that word professional, the way it is understood, and at the same time, from your surroundings. So these are some of the things, and I'm just mentioning a few. And as a result of this, that people don't find the space or the spaces we've created never sit never sit and talk about the causes of things which are fires. Because we don't talk about it, we remain unwell. And when we remain unwell, we get sick. And when we get sick, we become bitter and eventually we die very sad. So many activists have died very sad. So where is room for discussing these things? Is there an organization? You know, six and six. Okay, let's check in. Where are we? Heart, mind, and body. Let's check in. Are we on fire? The activist fire. What can we do that we are really on fire so that there is space for me to talk about this man who has been chasing me because I defended his wife? talk about religious fundamentalists in my community or cultural fundamentalists who are saying that, you know, I'm a whole in the whole village. I support issues of Where is it for me? I, even my, my family, some members of my family have got COVID, so I couldn't write my reports. Where is that room? Where is room for me? say that a friend is not well and I'm supporting that friend. So these are some of the things that make the I talk to unwell. The men that I talked to um, struggled with the issue of being mascul negative masculinity uh, and at the same time, you know, taking care of this is 
not the way they were brought up. They were brought up. If you mind, you, you know, these are soft issues. What have I violated and what? And very unviolated or soft issues. They are intangible issues. They are not issues that bring money into an organization. They are not issues that, you know, you write about. So what we have been trying to do is to find ways of addressing some of these issues. Uh, the Agent Action Fund in Africa is setting up farm and rest and can share information. We are trying to document these stories. Uh, we are trying to, to talk about wellness comprehensively because if a woman, things we do depending on the context, bring taking care of yourself, those things are really important. But at the same time, if a woman is being haunted by her community, you know, the chiefs are against her and some have had pack and, you know, really move from their communities. You can't tell her to breathe. She will breathe while she's running so that she can remain grounded. But you straight the white But it's not enough. Do we have money to support go and be safe? So we are trying to talk. It's okay to take your heart to work. And if you are happy, say you have, you know, a problems of extended family, the problem like me, COVID, they do. And we are uh, maybe we have not gone very far, but we are beginning to have. So we are we are we are working on some strategies and maybe in the course of two days we might share some. But from where I stand, these are some of the important things for us to remember that we will. We can take our hearts, our emotions, our you know the 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 the, 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 whole, the whole is who we are. And then that work, I not about in some parts and so on my way home. I'm going to pick parts of me and go home. It doesn't work because then you have got terrible fragmentation. And we're also trying to create organizations that sit and say, okay, what is ungrounding each one of us? And we are trying to continue identifying uh, fire extinguishing extinct. So over to you, Mary Ann. Thank you, Hope. So we'd really like to invite some of you to join us in this conversation. And we've got a few questions, but I, what we can do here, so this technology is new for most of us, but what we can do is we can have some people actually come on screen and chat with us and share some reflections also, if you'd like to. We have a few questions that we um, were, in wanting to invite people to potentially speak to around what does well-being mean for you and what barriers and challenges you might be seeing in your organization your work your space in the sector and also maybe and you don't have to answer all of these these are just for you know a starter but how and you might just pick one but how might you connect well-being with other processes of change around culture around power and um, we, so this is, there's a, a way to do this in Hopin, which is that you can ask to share your video and audio. I see that there's someone there doing that. So, and I know Joanne, you've been on the screen and you may or may not want to do that, but if you did want to let us know, I can see someone asking to come on. Um, so I'm gonna um, accept them. And, and if you're that person and you didn't actually want to come on, it's okay, we can always, you know, cause we're getting used to this technology. And others, if you let us know in the chat, if you'd like to come on and share a bit with us, we're gonna have, you know, maybe 20 minutes now of just in inviting audience participation and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, I think this per, who's that? I've just accepted you. I can't now see your name. <laughs> Um, no, I don't see. It. Maybe you've gone off. <laughs> Is there anybody who'd like to come on and reflect? I've seen people reflecting in the chat, and I don't know if any of the people that reflected in the chat would like to sort of share a bit more about what they were saying or respond to any of those questions that I posed around 
what well-being means to you or maybe the barriers that you see um, in, in, in relation to this topic. Um, hi, Smriti. Okay, I'm going to let you, so what you have to do, and we're just get used to this is um, you have to ask me to sh you have well you have to ask to share your video and audio and then I have to accept you so um, sweetie if you um, ask if you can see that button I hope you can and then I'll um, accept you to come on and join us it's just like a click thing can you see the button I'm not seeing it yet. <clears throat> uh, oh, there we go. So this is. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, Hooray! What? <laughs> I was not sure how this was going to work. I was also not that. sure. <laughs> you can hear me, right? We're hearing you loud and clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's this is such an important conversation because. Um, um, especially working with local and national organizations around and um, the lack of resources they have and how how can they make sure uh, well-being right now especially during the during the COVID time it's been a real stretch they're already stretched right normally <laughs> but COVID has really stretched them and then there's this whole, and I think this is where it all kind of comes, well-being, then organizational performance, and all these types of things, they come roll into one. I mean, some of the things that I hear uh, are around, oh, how can we trust that people are doing what they should be doing at home, <laughs> right? And, and so the people who are in charge, or who, who, who normally supervise others, they don't know how to deal with this situation. And sometimes because of that stress of that delivery, they become, um, because they don't know how, they become uh, maybe very demanding of the others who are working for them. And then the, the staff who are actually at home, wow, you know, they've got so much to cope with. <clears throat> Firstly, the access, because uh, before, um, sorry, my voice is going, <clears throat> before they, they don't have access to maybe even personal computers, they don't have access to internet, all these things. So now it's become a, a whole situation where they have to try and grapple with all this thing. Plus for the women, they are also at home, so they have, still have to do the home stuff <laughs> and also the work stuff. And somehow, you know, how do we have a conversation where we talk about all of these things as an organization? Uh, one of the things that I encourage the organizations to do is have um, every morning a cup of calm, <laughs> right? With the staff coming together with a cup of tea, just to find out how you are. It doesn't need to be half an hour, it's just 15 minutes. So you're together at the beginning of the day if you can so that you just check in on each other and if there are any things that are turning up for them for the day right any difficulties so there's this regular kind of contact because otherwise we are also isolated um, especially if we don't have the you know the know-how for the technology and everything so for the partners i would say if you're a partner with the local organization please check, you know, what can you do for them? How can you make sure that even you provide the data that's required so that people can connect with each other? There's so many small things you can do. It doesn't have to be a huge thing, right? But just check in with your partners. What can you do with each other? And I think um, also sharing with each other, I, I think I already put in the chat, I'm accompanying a, um, a local organization 30 staff just helping them to, to look at what do they need right now. And we've just been having these sessions with breathing and poetry and dancing together. And it's just lightened up that mood, right? That really helps them. And now they've integrated that in their, in their um, you know, weekly activity. So just that little confidence, right? 
just something that you do with them suddenly has given them real confidence to do things on their own. So I just want to share that with you. It's, it's such an important aspect. Um, any way that we can help uh, with, and also I think one-to-one -one coaching um, when it's required and if it's required also is a really important aspect um, of this. Thank you for letting me share with you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uma, did you want to add something? Oh, no, no. Um, <laughs> I thought, hi, Joanne. <laughs> oh, I, we can't hear you. I think you have to unmute at the bottom. There's a, you got it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, the screen with my initials. I'm sorry, I hadn't, I wondered why it was just me at the beginning, so, but more than that, thank you for sharing um, your learning from your interesting regional conversations. I'm based in the UK, currently working as a consultant, having worked for 12 years for Amnesty International um, in London with a global remit. But for the past 10 years as a consultant, I've worked, been working predominantly with male um, aid, uh, aid workers, researchers, development workers, um, many of whom have come from a former military background. So I thought I'd just share that learning um, because we have, you have touched on the challenge of the wellbeing conversation. And um, it was very clear to me and in many ways to the male aid workers and researchers I was working with that they were struggling with their own um, sense of, um, as Hope mentioned, bringing their professionalism to the table in their way, or as, uh, as Hope me mentioned as well about the, the male culture that they felt bound by. And um, one of the moments um, that connected their, themselves to well-being was by first of all starting the conversation about work, so making it integrated into their work a little bit more like an evaluation and making it a more formal conversation and taking it to an informal one, so almost like flipping it um, from what the, the previous speaker said. And so having a structured um, uh, or then a semi-structured interview, um, taking it from evaluation and then more finishing off um, with the informal. Um, I think it's about um, trust um, and building trust and meeting whoever you're talking to from the place where they are, be it, um, as you just said, working from home and those challenges and accepting that. But what I found from a male perspective is where they are is, I want, I've, got, I've come here to work and I want to talk about the work. I don't want to talk about what makes me feel and therefore my performance, but talk about the work. And then as you unpack that in a formal way, those that trust gets built, those barriers came down. This has taken time, um, but that, that was one reflection back I wanted to put in. Thanks for bringing that, Joanne. I think it's really interesting because we noticed in, I think, all our conversations that um, although we did have men participating, or in, at least in most of them we did, there were always or I, almost always less men participating in them. And I think, you know, it, it, it is something that we, you know, we have to acknowledge and think about. And we had been had thought a bit between ourselves as well about like, what are the things that we might have done differently or that we could do to encourage. And so it's really helpful to hear your reflections on that. And I think, you know, it, it probably those those reflections that you had probably don't just apply to men. Um, no. I imagine there are lots of people that 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 applies to, and I think we saw in all our conversations, you know, some level of resistance having conversation about like how I feel in relation to work, and they show those that resistance showed up differently in different contexts for different people. 
Mm-hmm. But there's something about, you know, can I break down this barrier of here I'm the professional and sort of, you know, and to what extent do I want to and need to and how, you know, and I think it's really an interesting, um, an interesting thing um, to think about. Like we, we, on the one hand, we we're thinking in the, in this gathering about how um, this aspect of, of well-being and care and, culture can feed the, the accountability and um, honesty and transparency of our sector and at the same time sometimes we, we think of that as being a very kind of professional procedural kind of thing and it came up in the opening conversation as well like how do we sort of bring more of ourselves more of our feelings more of our um, I guess I, what do I want to say honesty integrity you know our full selves and at the mm-hmm. same time, like honour those needs for um, accountability and structure. And I feel like for me, there's like this, it's almost like a dance. And someone talked about the book about, you know, about, we talked a bit in the chat about dancing, if you haven't seen it. But um, it's, like, it's like a dance between enough structure and then this space mm-hmm. that we create and, and trust, like you said, John, is like this crucial thing that we can only ever go. And I think it's, I think Adrienne Marie Brown says it at the speed of trust, right? And so with all these conversations, they're about relationship, they're about trust. And those things are the sort of fundamental center of them, I think. Would anyone else like to come on? We're just gonna go for another five to 10 minutes in this session. Hello. <laughs> Someone's coming. Hi, um, Leon. Hello, welcome. Um, thank you so much for accepting my request. Um, I feel too overwhelmed when I um, see all and coming out and sharing their experiences as to what their perspective of care or well-being in an organizational system is. Um, I might not be as sound uh, in terms of professional as you all are. Uh, I am young and I'm just starting in this uh, world of humanitarian organization. Um, I never thought that something like care or uh, well-being would be something that would come at such an early stage. But uh, to be very honest, um, I am an emotional person and uh, that is solely the reason why I got attached to the humanitarian uh, system wherein I thought that there are a number of people who need people like me or people like you all and that empathy or compassion somewhere down the line is missing from the entire picture of work, the work ethic that we talk about. And it is required at the end of the day. But um, I think emotions are often considered as a sign of weakness by the maybe the male members of the organization wherein it is usually mocked off or it is laughed at very easily. And um, as uh, Joanne was mentioning that, yes, men are like, okay, we want to work and we would like to stick to work and there is no place for human emotions. Then I think it is somewhere down the line too contradictory to the fact that you are a part of a system which includes a lot of emotional aspects as well unless and until you don't you aren't a good humanitarian from within yourself how will you be able to put their put yourself out in the field actually offer help to people who are in dire need of it because at the end of the day a, a mother or a child who's just or a, or a mother who's lost a child will not be searching for relief material at that point of time. What they would be needing is care. They would be needing understanding. So I think unless and until that internal understanding of uh, emotions are not there, um, I think we won't be able to become good humanitarians. Yeah, so that is what I would like to bring on the table. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's really nice to hear people's voices and and um, your reflections. I want to, before we close the session, I want to, because um, we're just going to go for a few more minutes, I want to welcome a couple of things. First of all, we've um, talked quite a bit about the differences between who 
you know, kind of women and men, and I want to name that um, there are people who don't identify on that gender binary, and there may be some in the audience. And I think we may be, um, I want to, I want to bring to this conversation an understanding that while we're talking about how we've engaged with different people in these conversations that um, we don't want to kind of give give the impression that well-being is is for women or that that gender binary is is is, is kind of inherently the only way to 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 live in this world and um I think that for me the perspective that I would have on that gendered nature of these conversations is also that kind of patriarchal structures affect us all and those these structures where it feels like we have to choose between being professional and being like you said in the chat like more human and more that binary is part of that whole system so I think we do want to problematize that in these conversations and 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 keep thinking of, um, about that at the same time as bringing like the experiences and so if, if there's anyone here who would like to come on and share any more about that we would totally welcome you and also I want to invite uh, so do let us know if you'd like to in the last couple of minutes and if no one comes on, I'd just like to give um, my my other facilitator colleagues a chance to just have a few, a couple of final reflections um, before we close this session. Um, who would like to? Okay, no First, uh, just because yeah. it's still in my head and I don't want to lose it. Uh, yeah. I I. You know, I like coming to those conversations because the work I do feels more human whenever I hear other people that are in, you know, that ha that share my experience in one way or another. That, that, you know, that I want to now go better and do something about my own well-being. And, and to that extent, I want to make sure that my team, that, you know, the people I care for at work as well, uh, you know, have that sense that they feel empowered as well. So this is why I feel like I keep coming back to this conversation to be able to hear from other people, other professionals, other aid workers like myself about that experience. And it, it makes it feel less alone. Yet sometimes I struggle with my uh, sort of responsible, you know, responsibility towards well-being. But you know, yeah. And I really like what uh, I think uh, some somewhere in the chat it says that to bring back the the heart and soul into humanitarian work because it's not just about outputs and outcomes and how much money we get but maybe at the end of the day it's like what are we here for you know how do we bring more of ourselves to work and more of that caring and compassion so that the people around us are you know not just treated as another worker another professional but you know another human that we connect with more than just colleagues so no i just want to say thank you to everyone because I feel really good about this today. <laughs> Thanks, no hide Um Uma, would you like to I'm just going across my screen who I <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um what I uh take away from this conversation and today's conversation is that uh, it goes back to the different needs and how are we uh going to support uh, these different needs. Uh I'm not uh terribly uh, open with my emotions and if someone asks how do you feel and if I don't know that person very well <laughs> I'm not going to tell exactly how I feel and I think it's okay and I think it's okay that some people want to keep a separate part of their personality from workplace and some people they simply don't want to share their personal side at work like my nephew he says I don't want anybody to know because I want to keep it separate so I think it's also okay and going back to a chat men again for me it goes back to the different needs maybe they don't want meditation maybe they want to play cricket or football and that would relieve stress so how is the organization using different needs different activities to bring uh, the gender uh, diversity but also uh, using uh, different activities to raise these um, well-being um, topic and for me uh, last but not least what I also learn from these conversations is that listening simply listening to each other and this was so much appreciated by each and everyone who participated in the conversation that they said that just having someone listen for two minutes each person going around the table 
two minutes and they were also amazed at how they were listening and how fascinated they were listening to other people and I think if that is something that we can do uh, genuinely listen I think that would open a lot of uh, doors and uh, start a lot of uh, changes in small ways which might lead to larger um, changes thanks uh, Marianne thank you Emma. let me come to you uh, Smriti, did you want to go and then I'll come to Hope to close yeah, up? A quick one. Um, so this thing about listening, and I think we really have to have deeper listening skills because we often <laughs> are not listening at the right level. Uh, we've been experimenting with this. We've been having some um, uh, conversation with a group of people. It's called Bridging the Divide. And in that conversation, we are using different tools to help people to be more authentic, to be more themselves. And then these are for the change makers, right? So how do you use these things to help to have the difficult conversations? Um, so I can share that tool with you because I found it so useful. Um, and we're going through a whole process where we're using different types of methods to get people to talk about uh, you know more difficult issues and being really authentic and and to bring change makers together i'll share that with you thanks thanks yeah do put it in the chat and then um, we can then add it to uh, we've got a resource a whole resource document which is at the reception area when you see there's some writing when you go into the reception area we've got it linked in there and so we'll be adding all these resources in there for people to be able to access afterwards also hope can i let you close us out of this session okay uh thanks very much uh thanks to all the contributors i'm writing and you know lest i forget say that the, the person is political and much as our structures were set up never take account of the personal it is the work and we cannot lock out the personal and think that we are doing work and the personal remains outside point is a because what works in asia might be in africa but also type the type of organization determines the kind of well-being that is needed uh, as i said earlier on different things so we have to understand the organization and what it does and see uh, in those organizations gender and gender and dynamics sexual orientation and many of those considered as we talk about well-being strategies especially in africa is very emotional we shouldn't apologize for being emotional there is no do this work what we experience really emotional and we need thinking about the that's you know uh, of women of you know organization that has worked we need to identify different strategies that we can borrow from or even share and above all we shouldn't be ashamed to take our hearts to work and we need to create organizations that allow us to take our hearts to work I mean, there are choices, yes. People have choices. Some will talk, some will not. But let the space be there for people to make those choices. So thanks very much to our speakers. Thanks very much for the space. Listened and contributed in the chat, but even sat and listened. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We have... Um, we have a, um, a session that is by invite only for CEOs and donors over lunchtime, but the next open session is at, oh, let me get this right. I think it's 2.30. I think it's 2.30 Geneva time, but please check the schedule. But it's essentially in like um, an hour and a half after the next hour that's coming. And we'll be talking about organizational culture um, change and we've got a, a panel of speakers and hope and I will be back with you then so we really look forward to seeing you again then invite you to take a break um, look after yourself do something you enjoy and we'll see you back then and check the schedule for the time in your time zone 
but just something to say if you haven't noticed the schedule adapts to your time zone so just to so the time you see should be the time for you thanks so much everyone and we'll see you later bye